So you want to get started investing, but every time you look into it, it gets really complicated really fast. Or your uncle has horror stories about how much money they've lost. But in your other ear, you hear over and over, you need to be investing. Well, you've come to the right place. In this video, we're going to cover how to invest, where to invest, when, how much, but most importantly, and to start off, why? Now, it's really important that you really grasp this concept so that you can stay motivated because the excitement of something new, as always, wears off. So you really need to hook into this because it is so important. In March of 2022, this year, of course, the inflation reading was 7.9%, which is ridiculously high. If you want to learn more about why this happened and how it got so far away from us, then go to my TikTok and check out my pinned financial series and you'll be able to see all of that. But you probably heard stories of your grandparents saying that a milkshake costs like 25 cents and today it's like five or six dollars. That is because of inflation. Now imagine you were trying to blow up a balloon, but every time you did, a little bit just kept squeaking out and you never could fill up that balloon entirely. That is inflation. So no matter how much you're saving, no matter how much you're making, budgeting, not buying Starbucks, whatever, it doesn't matter because currently if you are not making more than 7.9% on your money, then you are losing money. So the obvious next question is how do we stop that balloon from leaking or how do we stop losing money when we're not trying to? If you put $100 in your savings account, this time next year, if you don't make 7.9% or greater on your money, assuming that inflation rate stayed the same, $100 would only be worth about $92. So the other problem is that you can't just put it in a savings account because most of the savings account have the most minuscule, ridiculous interest. Like here's 0.02% for putting your life savings in our account. Thanks. So outside of traditional finance like cryptocurrency, there are options that you can stake a stable coin for 10, 20, 30%, but that's not what we're gonna cover in this because I really want the first step of your investment journey to focus on traditional finance. And so again, if you have money sitting in a savings account, which we are told is the right thing to do, then you are losing money on it. So you have to make that money. To understand how to invest, you need to first understand what is an investment. So by definition, an investment is an action or process of investing money for profits or material results, AKA acquiring an asset to generate income or appreciate. One common investment goal that people have is real estate. So the way that works is if you buy a house and rent it out to somebody, that monthly rental income minus all of your expenses, your mortgage, the AC repair, whatever, that is your profit. So that is your investment return every single month. But more importantly, over a period of time, that house that you bought, most likely, especially if you bought it in the last couple of years, has gone up tremendously in value. So there's multiple ways that you, that asset or that investment is appreciating for you. Again, that's monthly rental income, as well as the actual appreciation of the house. But investing in real estate has a really high barrier of entry, especially if you live like me in California, where the medium home price is $800,000. But there is a great way to start investing that does not require a lot of money, does not require a lot of effort, a lot of time, a lot of maintenance. And that's what we're going to talk about today. When you invest in a company on the stock market, it's called buying shares. So you buy shares of the company and that makes you a part owner. So imagine a public traded company like Google is a pizza. Well, if you buy a slice of the pizza or a share, then you own part of the whole company. So one way that you can make profits on an investment is through dividends. So if I bought a company that pays dividends, they don't all, then as a part owner, when the company is sitting on so much profits, they decide they're going to give some to the people who invested in the company, then I get a percentage of the dividends equivalent to the percentage of shares of the company that I own. The other way that people make money in the stock market similar to real estate is that the shares of the stock that they own appreciate over time. For example, if let's say fake company A was valued at $10 a share and then suddenly Elon Musk tweeted that saw a great future for them, you can bet that the share price of that company is going to go up. The price of that has gone up because that had been a profitable company, the aspect and growth of the company has improved. So holding a share price over time that is more than what you paid for it 
is appreciation and it's a way that you make money in the stock market. So how do you actually buy shares of a company? So you don't just go to tesla.com forward slash shares, you actually have to go to a broker, also known as a brokerage. Now this used to actually be a physical place and then it was a phone number that you would call and all these things, but fortunately now, because of technology, it is a website, sometimes it's a mobile app, and there are thousands in the United States. And based on what I have personally used, I'm gonna put some recommendations down in the bottom description, but it's really important to understand two aspects. Easy to use and low to minimal fees, but we're gonna to get to that later. Do not jump off and go start opening an account because we got a lot more to cover. There are over 40,000 stocks in the stock market to choose from. So imagine it's like going to an ice cream shop and you walk in and you just have 40,000 different flavors to choose from. You're probably gonna have a really hard time. Now I know when you hear people talk about investing on social media, they are usually talking about individual stocks, but I promise you that is not the way to go and I'm gonna tell you why. If you buy shares of an individual stock, which I'm not saying that you never will, but especially while you're getting started, if you buy shares of an individual stock, then you are putting essentially all of your eggs in that basket. Even if it's only 500 of the $1,000 of your account, you're putting $500 in that company. And there have been so many companies, even in my lifetime, who are seemingly great, amazing, profitable with a bright future that suddenly just like go bankrupt and go belly up. And so choosing these individual stocks is a prediction on its future, which we are as human beings incapable of doing. Now, as you get more experience, you are likely to dabble in a bit of individual stocks. And I think it's pretty typical to pick some of the majors like Apple, Tesla, Google, Amazon, but certainly starting out and possibly forever, you're gonna wanna go with something else. And don't just take my word for it, some of your favorite YouTubers such as Andre Jek, Ali Abdel, Graham Stephan, the authors of these incredible finance books and many, many more I'm sure, all recommend investing in low cost index funds. So what is an index fund? An index fund is most commonly referred to as a basket of stocks. So if you're buying a slice of that pizza, it's not a pizza of one company, it's a pizza that's mixed of all of these companies. I'm really going hard into this pizza analogy here. The S&P 500 is one of if probably the most popular index in the world that holds the 500 largest companies in the United States. Their holdings include Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Tesla, all the way down to on the 500th, things that you probably haven't heard about, including Alaska Airlines. So instead of having to buy 500 stocks individually and manage them and diversify them and put 10% here, 3%, 1%, a quarter percent, it's done automatically for you through this index. And again, this fund means that people are pooling their money together. And the best thing about an index fund managed by a computer, so it's done automatically, that means you're not going to interfere with human emotion, right? If we get people get really scared and they make these changes to the account, or two, you don't have to pay a salary. Now before I get too far along, I wanna put a big red flag on mutual funds. And the reason being is similar to an index, it is a basket of funds, except it is managed by a person, usually who has an Ivy League degree and has a very high salary. So not only do mutual funds not even have a great track record of being profitable, but they have a very high fee, generally. So take a 2% fee, doesn't sound like much, but I'm gonna share an example with you from Unshakable by Tony Robbins. Assume the stock market gives 7% return over 50 years. Thanks to compound interest, every $1 will grow to $30. But if your account has a 2% fee, that doesn't sound like much, but that brings your return to 5%. 5% over 50 years brings every $1 only to 10. So if you have a 2% fee over 50 years, you are washing away two thirds, 66% of your return to somebody else's pocket. I think the best part about an index fund is just like starting anything in, ha anything in life, whether it's removing a habit, starting a new skill, a weight loss journey, a new job, whatever it is, if it's really difficult in the beginning or really at all, then the likelihood of you continuing that long term decrease dramatically. An index fund is very, very easy to purchase. 
as long as you have your index that you're going to invest in, it's just a couple clicks, literally. Once your account's set up, once you have money in the account, probably realistically under 10 clicks of a mouse can you buy these shares. So it's extremely easy. And like I said, the more friction that you have on doing something, the less likelihood that you're gonna continue. And this is about as frictionless as it can be. Now, I know a lot of people who hold almost all of their net worth in the S&P 500. But like I said, there are some other ones that rely heavily, more heavily on tech. But again, the S&P 500, I think, is an incredible option because it's the 500 largest companies in the United States. So you're probably wondering, is it risky? Now, a lot of people probably have an uncle or a cousin or a brother or somebody who has lost a lot of money investing and they have that in the back of their ear all the time. Hopefully not, but it's really common. So let's take a step back. There's a common saying in finance that is you don't lose money until you sell, which sounds really obvious and I will even say in cryptocurrency, some people kind of use that saying to the extreme. But the way it goes is that if I buy something for $10, as long as I never sell it for less than $10, then I've made money or not lost money at least. Now within a few days and hours of each other, the share price that you buy on an index is very likely to fluctuate lower than what you paid for it. It's just volatile within the intraday. It's called intraday volatility actually. So it is very common to buy something and within 10 minutes, three minutes, an hour, five hours, it's three, five, ten dollars less than what you paid for it, which I know doesn't feel good, but we're not worried about the day to day. But I promise if you are buying the mainstream indices over the long term, your investment goes up. At least that's what history has always shown us. So let's say you bought one share of the S&P 500 in February of 2020. The price was around $330. Well, a couple weeks later, the pandemic broke out and in March of 2020, the price of the S&P 500 was down 35%. Your, your $330 investment was now sitting at $214, which does not feel good. But if you held on to that, you never sold, then that $330 investment is now worth $430. So a couple lessons that I wish I knew when I started investing 14 years ago. Number one is to be long term. It is really easy to check your portfolio and be down $20 and say, you know what, I just want my $40 back. What good is this investing? All it's done is lost me money, especially if you're scared or if you're skeptical or if you didn't have all your questions answered. As soon as something starts looking awry, that uncle in your ear says, see, I told you, and it's just not gonna go well. But if you can be long-term and if you can focus on the large main indices, which is plural for index, the longer you wait, the more you will be rewarded. Lesson number two, similar to lesson number one, but investing is a skill that we are acquiring of delayed gratification. So I know this because I've done it many times, but when we start dealing with money, we start planning for a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, we start picking out new outfits, we start pre-ordering a Tesla or the house or all of these things and it's a natural human behavior. But we are not investing to build wealth that we're gonna be using within a couple of years. Now I hear all the time, I don't wanna be wealthy when I'm older, I wanna be wealthy now. And I totally get it, but we have to work with what's in our control. And remember that balloon that is just leaking out with inflation, no matter what you are doing right now, you are losing money. So we're not, I'm not asking you to put out that way hundreds of thousands of dollars that you don't have. The money that we can be working with here is five, 10, 15, 30, a hundred dollars. Okay. So we're not dealing with these massive amounts of money, but when you give the, that money time to compound over time, it grows tremendously. So again, I get it. You want the Porsche when you're 30, not when you're 60. And I totally understand that, but just set it up, right? Just set it up for when you're 60, just in case. So you can start hustling for the short term and preparing for the long term. Lesson number three is you really just gotta treat investing like a house plant. So if I get a new plant, I'm really excited. I'm gonna pay attention to it all the time. I'm probably gonna overwater it. I'm going to hyper fixate as soon as it gets a little dot on it. I'm gonna change its position in the sun all the time and I'm honestly probably just gonna suffocate it to death. The best thing that you can do for your plants, as well as your investments, 
is buy them, tend to them on a regular schedule, and leave it alone. Also, like, enjoy from a distance because who doesn't love looking at a portfolio or a houseplant? Lesson number four, by far the most important, so I probably should have made this lesson number one, is make sure that your finances are in order before you start investing. I understand that it is very, very tempting, but get this, let's say you're driving, you get a flat tire, you need a new tire, and you don't have a dollar in your savings account. If you don't have an emergency savings fund, then your only choice is to sell your account and cash out to get that new tire. But let's say it just so happened that this was in March of 2020 when the stock market was down 35%. So even if you had the intention of being long-term, sorry, you're stranded on the side of the road. You have 48 hours before the tow shop is gonna take you to the pound. Like you need a new tire. So you're forced to sell. So you need at least, it's recommended three to six months of living expenses in a high yield savings account. Now again, high yield savings is not gonna be inflation, but it's gonna be a lot better than my Chase Bank, which is like 0 0.02 or something laughable. And the other part of that is also paying off your high interest debt. So if you have, let's say, a lot on a credit card and it's an 18% APR, you're not gonna be doing yourself any favor by making 10, 12% in the stock market if you have 18% on your credit card. Not to mention, that's not really a game you wanna play of, oh, I'm doing more in the stock market so I can put it on my credit card, because holding a balance on your credit card is actually bad for your credit. Okay, my memory card filled up, and so I had to come back. Um, if I missed anything, that's why. But up next, I'm sure you're probably convinced by now, you're probably subscribed to the channel, you probably like this video if you found it useful, but more importantly, you're probably wondering, where do I start? So you're gonna wanna find an online brokerage. You can find so many of them. Like I said, I have some linked down below in the description. Again, you're looking for two things. Number one, a brokerage that allows you to invest in indices and that they have little to no fees. That is so important. Now, a lot of modern apps now have a mobile app, which is really great, but I'm honestly gonna recommend for most people to do a platform without worrying about the mobile app because if you have your portfolio at the tip of your fingers at all time, the likelihood that you panic sell or that you just take that cash out because you just need it really bad or whatever, I think the likelihood of that compounds dramatically. So just stick with the desktop platform I think is probably your best bet. I personally have never met anyone who has invested long term in the stock market and regretted it. So it doesn't matter if you're starting with $1, $10, or the biggest thing, what you're really doing here is training yourself, especially if you have such a small number. A book that I recommend everyone to read is called The Slight Edge. It's the feeling that when we're doing these teeny tiny movements that we don't actually gain anything from them, but that's quite the opposite. These teeny tiny movements compounded over time grow to be a tremendous difference and that's exactly what you're setting yourself up for. So thanks for watching. If you like this kind of content, stick around. I'll see you soon.